right, let's uh, begin our second class by studying principle number three. It's on page four of your syllabus, and um, hopefully we'll be able to cover most of this principle in uh, this, our second class. Principle number three is that we are supposed to remember to study the historical and cultural background, the grammar, the syntax, and the vocabulary of the passage that we are considering. In other words, there's a lot of work that goes into studying the text itself within its context. Now, prayer can never take the place of in-depth, careful, and exhaustive, as well as exhausting sometimes, investigation of the text. We must do a basic study of the text or passage that we are dealing with. Uh, here are some principles to remember, and I have 12 principles here under this uh, third principle, uh, which is talking about dealing with the text itself. Uh, first of all, Peter stated that Paul wrote some things that are hard to understand, which the unlearned twist to their own destruction. This must mean that the Bible, the study of the Bible, is not always easy. Profound Bible study requires time and effort. It is not enough to read the Bible, we must search the Bible. There is a, there is a grave danger, folks, of being hasty and superficial in our study of Scripture, because we haven't carefully examined and correlated all of the evidence that comes from the text. Bible study is like detective work, looking for clues here and there, and then bringing all of the evidence together to solve the case, so to speak. Our study must be meticulous and exhaustive. In other words, it's not enough to pray. We must pray, and then we must study. Uh, you know, God will not do for us what we can do for ourselves. He has given us resources to do it. So the first principle is that uh, we need to dedicate time and effort in gathering all of the information. Second, this is at the top of page five, we should always pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our study. The Holy Spirit inspired the Bible, and for this reason He is the only one who can explain what it means. And we might have to read a text several times before we are able to make any sense of what the text is trying to tell us. Third, try and discover what the text means before you try to determine what it means to you. Are you understanding the difference? The Bible text has an objective inherent meaning independently of what you think. Correct? Amen. Did God inject in the text a meaning that's apart from me? Yes. Sure. The danger of Bible study groups where people ask what does this text mean to you is that we will put our own spin on the text instead of allowing the text to speak for itself. As a result, we end up with many opinions about the text, but not necessarily with the meaning that the writer intended. Sad to say, in many study groups, what the people are doing is pooling their ignorance. How can you give your opinion about what the text means to you if you haven't studied what the text means? The Apostle Peter assures us that no prophecy is of any private interpretation. In short, beware of determining what the Bible means to you until you are sure what the text really means. We are to extract from the Bible what it means rather than putting into the Bible what we think it means or what we want it to say. Point number four. Carefully examine the context, and I'm going to give you examples of most of these in a few moments, but I wanted to go through the principles first. Carefully examine the context, 
That is, that is what comes before and after the passage that you're studying. Many times the context contains the key that unlocks the meaning of the passage that we are struggling with. So read what comes before and what comes after. It's vitally important because some people simply isolate a text and they say that this text means this when it doesn't mean that at all. To give you an example, Colossians chapter 2, no, let no one judge you about the Sabbath. Well, you know, <laughs> Taj is, is, uh, is an evangelist, he, he faces people all the time who use that text to say, see, you know, or nobody judge you regarding days. So they take that one verse. But they don't look at the context, the immediate context, as well as the broader biblical context. So the context is critically important. Point number five. When you read the Bible, mark the key words and write your own notes and comments in the margins. Any questions, any comments you have, write them in the margins. Very important. In this way, when you are studying the passage, many other related Bible passages will come to mind and help you understand the specific passage that you are studying when you read over and over again. Number six, if you are not able to read the original languages, read the passage in as many Bible versions as possible. It is highly unlikely, although once in a great while, it does happen, that all Bible versions are wrong in their translation. And be very careful with paraphrases and amplified versions, because they are not translations, they are interpretations. So we have to be very careful with those. Seventh, do a careful study of the meaning of key words in the passage. You can do this by using a Bible concordance, such as Strong's. So look for other passages that use the same word. Frequently the same words are used in other passages of the Bible. A careful study of these words in other passages of the Bible will help you understand much better the passage or the verse that you are studying or that you are considering. Number eight, look at the marginal references for any parallel passages to the one that you are studying. Uh, some of these connections are priceless and I'll be giving you some examples in a few moments. Number nine, study the grammar and syntax of the passage. Uh, by syntax we mean word order. Our verb tenses important? They most certainly are, extremely important. You don't need to, do, to, to know the original languages to do this. Uh, there are many resources in English which can help you in this regard. Uh, good Greek English and Hebrew English lexicon uh, would be very valuable. And um, you know, in our free time, when we're not in class, I'll be glad to share with you the software that I use. It's a software that anyone can use, whether you've studied Greek or Hebrew or not. Uh, you can find out the meanings of words, the tenses. Uh, you know, it, it's amazing. It's an amazing software. Number 10, learn to ask questions. We already covered this of the passage that you are studying. A good detective is a good questioner. Some of you might be too young to remember Lieutenant Columbo. He asked and asked until the guilty party self-incriminated himself. What does the passage say? What does the passage not say? Why does it say things in the way it does? Who wrote the passage? To whom was it written? What special circumstances led to its writing? From where was it written? When was it written? Learn to reflect on what you are reading. It is like looking in a mirror. You look into the mirror and suddenly the mirror starts looking at you. In other words, the mirror talks back to you. We should study the Bible and then the Bible will study us. Number 11. After you have done all your personal research, this is very important. Many people go to Ellen White first. I always go to Ellen White last because I, I enjoy the excitement of discovering it for myself. And then I go to Ellen White to see if I missed anything, and many times I've missed quite a bit. After you've done all your study, go to see what Ellen White has to say about that verse, 
or about that passage. Read the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary or other commentaries to see what those commentaries have to say about that verse or about that passage because there might be something that you missed in your own personal study. And finally, number 12, when you've finished your research, put all of the pieces of information together and reach your conclusions and see how the passage can help your spiritual life by enhancing it, protecting it, enriching it, and correcting it. You must now be willing to obey what you have learned. The purpose of the Bible study is not to increase our intellectual knowledge. The final goal of all Bible study is obedience. So those are some of the principles that uh, we need to apply when we study the text itself. Now let me give you a few examples of uh, the importance of all of these little nuances that we find within the text. First of all, the importance of the historical background. Go with me to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3 and verses 3 through 11. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 3 through 11. This is the Apostle Paul speaking, and we'll have occasion to come back to this a little later on in our class. Uh, here the Apostle Paul says this, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, would it be helpful to us to go to Paul's conversion story in the book of Acts to understand what he's saying? Could you understand what he's saying if you didn't understand who Saul of Tarsus was before his conversion? It wouldn't make any sense. So you have to go beyond this text to another context that will help you understand where the Apostle Paul is coming from here. Now notice verse 7. This is the road to Damascus experience. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in Him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Would it be helpful for us to, to read about who Saul was before and his conversion experience to understand what he's saying here? Yes. And so what I'm saying is we need to know the historical background to passages. Incidentally, when the Apostle Paul says, I've lost all things for Christ, this is one of his prison epistles. He was in prison. And he'd lost everything for the cause of Christ. And so does it help to know where he's writing from? Of course. Where he's writing from, what his frame of reference is, what his experience has been, will help us understand a text. You can't isolate a text from the experience of the writer. So the historical background is extremely important. Now what about verb tenses? Is the verb tense important? It most certainly is. Let me give you an example. Uh, Revelation chapter 11 and verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Now, um, we're going to find something later on in the class, and that is that many of the texts that we find in Revelation, uh, the division of chapters, are in the wrong place. Actually, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, belongs with Revelation chapter 10. 
And we're going to find that Revelation 14, 1 to 5 belongs to Revelation 13. And we're going to find that Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1 belongs to chapter 20. Now there's the translators, because they didn't uh, understand the literary structure, how the order of events, which we understand uh, through the help of the spirit of prophecy, they divided the chapters where they felt that the chapters should be divided, but uh, they divided the chapters in the wrong place. And we'll come back to that when we deal with the literary structure of Daniel Revelation. There's no way we can understand Revelation unless we understand how the book was organized. It's impossible. Because the book of Revelation is not in chronological order. I mean, it jumps back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, if you try to read it from Revelation 1 verse 1 through Revelation chapter 22, the last verse, and say, okay, I want to know what's going to happen in the course of, of Christian history, and in the end time, you'll be so confused, you won't know what planet you're on. But once you know the code, once you know how the book is structured, Daniel and Revelation, then you know exactly where each event takes place. Now notice verse 2. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Now, what is the issue here? It gives the impression that, uh, that the court was given to the Gentiles, and then they trample for 42 months, right? That's the impression that you get from it. And so some people have said that the 42 months are future. They're a different period than 1260 days or time, times, and the dividing of time. But when you realize that there's a verb tense, and it actually says, but leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given, really it says, it was given to the Gentiles to trample the city underfoot for 42 months. In other words, the tense of the verb is past. The tense of the verb is not that from this point on, you know, this, uh, this event is going to take place during the 42 months. No, the, the 42 months are past from this point. The 42 months are not future from this point. Now, also cases are important when we study uh, the biblical text. Uh, let me give you an example here, which is very interesting. Acts chapter 9 and verse 7. Acts chapter 9 and verse 7. And, uh, you know, sometimes you ha read things in the Bible that appear to be a contradiction, but uh, they're not really a contradiction when you take into account uh, the biblical testimony, the totality of the biblical testimony. Notice uh, Acts chapter um, 9 and verse 7. It says, And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. So were those who were present, did they hear a voice? Yes, yes they heard a voice. Uh, now let's go to Acts 22 verse 9, which is the parallel verse speaking about the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Uh, Acts chapter 22 and verse 9. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Do you see the problem? 9 verse 7 says what? They heard. Chapter 22 says they didn't hear. So the Bible contradicts itself, right? Wrong. That's why we need, in, in, in Greek there are four cases. There's the nominative case, there's the accusative case, there's the genitive case, and there's the dative case. And, uh, the, and, and I'm not going to go into all of the details now. You can get this on this software that I was mentioning. But the fact is that when the Greek uses the word akul, that is the word to hear, when it uses the word akul in the genitive case, it means to hear without understanding. But when it's used in the accusative case, it means to hear with the understanding. 
And so you, you would never know that if you read the text, and so people say the Bible contradicts itself, but depending on which case, whether it's the, the genitive case or the accusative case, it means to hear with the understanding or it means to hear without the understanding. So there's no contradiction, it's a matter of Greek grammar, in other words. Now we're going to skip the one on the importance of the structure of the passage, we're going to deal with the 70 weeks a li little bit later on. Let's notice the importance of the meaning of words. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, you've read in Great Controversy where Ellen White states that uh, Satan is going to counterfeit the second coming, right? He's going to sh come, to, uh, you know, like Jesus is described in Revelation chapter 1, a glorious being. Well, I want you to notice uh, something very interesting here in chapter 2 and beginning with verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that word coming there is the Greek word parousia. Very important word, parousia. It's one of the second coming words. And so now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. So in other words, uh, what Paul is saying here is that Jesus is going to have a parousia. Jesus is going to have a coming. He's speaking about the coming of Jesus, the parousia of Jesus. But now let's notice, uh, let's go down to verse um, 9. Verse 9, the very same word is used. And let's actually read verse 8 for the context. It says, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And then it says, the coming of the lawless one. Do you know what that word coming is there? Parousia. The identical word that is used in verse 1 to describe the second coming of Christ. Are you following me? Is it important to know it's the same word? Of course. So it says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all, and then there's three words, signs, lying wonders, and power. Lying wonders is one Greek word. You know, there's only one other place in the Bible where that combination of identical three words is used, and that's referring to the miracles that Jesus performed. So when you realize that verse 1 is using parousia to describe the second coming of Christ, and verse 9 uses the same word to speak of the parousia or the coming of the lawless one, you know that Satan is going to falsify the parousia. He's going to falsify the second coming of Christ. He's going to counterfeit the second coming of Christ. And of course Ellen White calls this the almost overmastering delusion. Another example of the importance of words is the expression temple of God. You know, uh, when uh, people read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says that the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God showing that he is God. Do you know how, how most Protestants interpret that expression, temple of God? They say, oh, the temple of God, that is the Jewish temple that's going to be rebuilt in the Middle East. And there's going to be a personal nasty Antichrist who blasphemes God. He's going to sit in that rebuilt temple and he's going to build a great big statue of himself, an image, and he's going to command everyone to worship the image of himself, and whoever doesn't worship will be killed. They interpret the temple of God as a rebuilt Jewish temple in the Middle East. However, we need to see how the Apostle Paul uses the expression temple of God in all of his writings. Never once does the Apostle Paul use the expression temple of God to refer to a rebuilt Jewish temple. The expression, if you study it in all of his writings, refers to the spiritual temple which is the church. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2 and you'll see this. Uh, this is also the importance of studying the context and studying the meanings of words and expressions. We need to go to the totality of the testimony of scriptures. Notice um, Ephesians chapter 2 
and let's see what Paul means by the temple. Is it the rebuilt Jewish temple in the Middle East? Absolutely not. It says there in verse 19, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, he's writing to the Gentiles, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built, now listen carefully, on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What kind of foundations does the temple have? They're not stones, they are what? People, primarily the writings of people. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So is this a literal temple? No. Verse 21, in whom the whole building, see, the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The identical word, temple. Naos, temple, that is used in 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 2. So it says, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together, now listen carefully, for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. What is the Shekinah in the temple today? You know, the Shekinah glory that, that came into the temple, the visible glory in the Old Testament. What is the, uh, what is the glory today? Holy it's the Holy Spirit. So are the foundations literal stones? No. Is the chief cornerstone literal stone? No. Are the individual stones, which is us, are those real stones? No. Is, is this a physical glory that can be seen? No. So when the Apostle Paul says that the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple of God, what temple is it referring to? The Antichrist is going to sit in the church, the spiritual temple of God. Because there's only one literal temple today, and that's the temple in heaven. See, the, the, the literal temple is in heaven. Right? And our literal high priest is in heaven. And the literal stones are in heaven. And the literal glory is in heaven. So there's, not, there's no fulfillment in the Middle East. When you take into account the meaning of the expression and you allow Paul to interpret Paul. Now we already, already took a look at, a, at an example from uh, Matthew 24 on the importance of the immediate context. Is it important to know the immediate context to a passage? Yeah, you know, sometimes we just go to verse uh, 4 where it says, let no one deceive you in any way for false Christ shall arise. You know, we're interested in getting to the signs of the second coming. But we forget to read uh, the first three verses where it gives us the context. And it shows that Matthew 24 has a twofold application. The two questions that we mentioned. That's the context. Now, the, when are these things going to be? When is the temple going to be destroyed so that there's not one stone left upon another? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the, of the age or the end of the world? And then Jesus says, okay, let me tell you. I'm going to blend the two descriptions. The context gives us the twofold application of Matthew 24. And so we need to take into account the context. We also need to take into account the broader context of a passage. And what I mean by a broader context is not only what comes immediately before and after the passage, but also what the totality of Scripture has to say about that same theme or that same topic. And I have here as an example um, Matthew 24, 37 to 39. You know, there's this text that says one will be taken and one will be left. And so, you know, we've reached the conclusion that the one that is taken is taken to heaven and the one that is left is left behind. You know, basically we argue in, in the Adventist church the same way that, uh, that the Pentecostals argue, except that they believe that the, the, that the saints will be taken seven years before the glorious coming of Christ. But they still understand taken as those who are taken to heaven and those who are left that are left behind. But I believe that this translation or this understanding does not take into account the broader context of Scripture. What has Jesus been talking about in verses 37 to 39 immediately before he says one will be taken and one will be left? He's been describing the flood. And so what is the broader context of, this, of these verses that are being read? The broader context is Genesis. Because it's referring to Genesis. Are you understanding me? Are you following me? So what do we have to do? We have to go beyond the immediate context to 
the broader context. We go back to Genesis, and there we describe who is taken and who is left. Genesis 7, 22 and 23. Genesis chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. The whole story of the flood is an amazing story. It's a typological story in every, every regard. I mean, it's the clearest presentation of end time events, I believe, uh, the broad outline of end time events uh, that we find in the Bible. Uh, Genesis 7, verses 22 and 23. Uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, all that was on dry land, died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And if you read many modern versions, it says that only Noah and his family were left. You see, the word left is a remnant word. For example, when a flood, when a flood takes away uh, a city, we say, well, wasn't anyone left? The word left has to do with the remnant. In Greek, it's the word loipos. You know, the, the, the dragon makes war against the remnant of her seed. Who is the remnant? They are those who are what? Who are left or remain. Uh, you know, go with me to 1 Thessalonians 4. The importance, once again, of looking at, at other texts of Scripture, the broader context. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And let's read beginning with verse 15. Chapter 4 and verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and what? And remain. So who are the remaining ones? The The, the saved. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord by, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And so who are those who remain? They're the righteous. Let's finish reading verse uh, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and... There it is again. And remain, or are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Let's notice one further text on this. Um, Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24. See, you're dealing with a remnant word here. And you'll only know it if you go to the broader context, the flood story. Isaiah chapter 24. And by the way, Isaiah 24 is describing the second coming of Christ. You can read all of the previous verses. It's a, it's a vivid description of the destruction of the world at the second coming of Jesus. And I want you to notice what we find in uh, verse, actually let's read verse of 3 so that you can see the context. It says, The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and fades away, the world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore the cursed has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. Now, that's describing the second coming of Christ, which it is. Clearly, the spirit of prophecy shows it, and the context shows it. Who would be the ones who are left? Let me ask you, is there, any, is there going to be anyone left alive when Jesus comes here on earth? Any of the wicked people going to be left alive on earth? No. So who are those that when the destruction comes and, and human beings are destroyed or burned, who are the ones that are left, the few that are left? It has to be the righteous. So what does the word left mean? It means the remnant. Uh, I said this was the last passage. Let me go to one more. Isaiah 4. Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4. And notice verses 
4 and 5. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night uh, for over all the glory there will be a covering and there will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime from the heat for a place of refuge, for a shelter from storm and rain. That's speaking about what God is going to do for the righteous, right? Now notice verses 2 and 3. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have what? Escaped. Because the previous verses are talking about destruction. Verse 3. And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem shall be called holy. So who are the left ones? The holy ones. Very same word left that is used in Genesis chapter 7, verse 23. So is it important for us to take into account the broader context to understand what a phrase or a passage means? It is indispensable. Now let me go to one final point uh, in, in this section, and that is the importance of the definite article. Do you know what a definite, definite article is? The house. T-H-E is a definite article. Now in Greek, in Greek you have a masculine definite article, you have a feminine de definite article, and you have a neuter definite article. So in Greek, uh, you know, you can tell whether the, the word is masculine, feminine, or, or neutral uh, by, the, by the article. Not so in English. In English all you have is the. So English is limited. You don't, you, know, you don't know whether the man is masculine or feminine by the definite article. But now I want to show you the importance of the definite article. Uh, go with me to um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which we were looking at a, a little while ago. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 11. We've already discussed the word parousia, which is a very important word. But now let's notice verse 11. Speaking about those who don't embrace the truth, they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. It's not that God sends them the delusion, but God allows them to be deluded. Because in the Bible, what God allows, the Bible speaks as if God did it. But it's indirectly, because God is allowing it. So it says, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. The King James says a lie, I think, right? But in Greek it says the lie. The question is, in context, which lie? The counterfeit second coming. Is that the lie that the immediate context speaks about? The almost overmastering delusion? Whose coming, whose parousia is according to the working of Satan, according to the context? And those who do not receive the love of the truth, they will believe what? They will believe not a lie, any old lie, they will believe the lie. In other words, they will accept the counterfeit second coming of Christ. And folks, let me say this. Uh, there were a few of you that were in church on Sabbath, and I'm going to go over that material here in class when we discuss the different methods of interpreting prophecy, preterism, futurism, and historicism. But is it important for us to know how Jesus will come? It is vitally important. You know, once somebody said to me, I don't really care you know, how he's coming. I only care that he's coming. <laughs> well, the fact is, if you don't know how he's coming, you're going to accept the wrong who. It's that simple. And there's a way in which we can know whether it's the true Christ or not the true Christ, and it's only based on Scripture. It's not based on your feelings, your emotions, your eyes, your ears, your, your touch, none of those things. It's whether you're firmly grounded and founded upon Scripture. So, is it important to take into account all of these things? See, Bible study is a taxing experience. 
You know, you have to study all these things. You say, how can I study all these things? I don't know the original language. You don't have to know the original languages anymore. There's software that presents it all to you in English or in Spanish, and I assume in, in Portuguese, I'm sure, because there's millions and millions of people who speak Portuguese. And so, and so folks, what we need to do is we need to do our homework. We need to look at all of these things. We need to look, to look at the historical background. We need to look at the tenses of the verbs. We need to you know, look at, the, at when there's an apparent contradiction. Maybe it has to do with the particular case that is involved. We need to look at the structure of the passage, and we'll study more about that. We need to look at the meaning of words. We need to look at the immediate and the broader context. We need to look what, what, what the article is. I mean, we need to exhaust every means possible to study all the details about the passage. So it's not enough just to pray. We pray, and then we work. You know, Ellen White says that those who do nothing but pray will eventually stop praying. <laughs> and I believe in prayer, but I also believe in hard work. I believe that you have to pray and then you have to sweat. And it takes a lot of work to sit down and study scripture. And the more you do it, the easier it'll become. You know, at first, you know, you, you say, well, all of these things, you know, how am I going to do all of this? You know, as you practice it, it'll become second nature. It'll become natural. Okay, now let's go to principle. Is this okay? So far so good? Okay, now let's go to principle number four. We're on a roll. Principle number four. The Bible is its own interpreter. That's what is called sola scriptura. The Bible alone. Now let's go through this principle. The Bible is an organic whole and a spiritual unity. And as such, it is its, it is its own interpreter. The Holy Spirit has placed within the Bible everything that we need in order to correctly interpret every single verse of the Bible. We don't need any external source to interpret the Bible. The Holy Spirit has placed within Scripture the key to interpret every verse. The Holy Spirit supervised the composition of Scripture. Do we have all the books in the Bible that the Holy Spirit wanted us to have? Yes. 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 He not only supervised the giving of Scripture, but the, but the forming of the canon of Scripture. And the Holy Spirit, because He superintended the composition of Scripture, has placed within it everything we need to explain every single part. We must be aware of dissecting Scripture like the liberal scholars who use what is known as the historical critical method. This method is a method of doubt. In other words, nothing in Scripture is accepted at face value. They, they, they say, oh, well, can you really trust this? Can you trust that? Well, have we ever seen anybody raised from the dead today? Well, well, how can we believe that happened back then if it's not happening today? It's a method of doubting Scripture and dissecting Scripture. This method does not allow one part of the Bible to explain other parts. In other words, the unity of Scripture is denied. They say that each author you know, presented his perspective, and there's contradictions between one and the other. The Bible is just one big collection of human opinions. And so they dissect and say, this is inspired and this isn't inspired. We can't go down that road. For example, its advocates believe that the Pentateuch, that's the five books of Moses, was written by four different authors. J-E-D-P, I won't get into that. And none of those authors was Moses. And, and incidentally, we're not talking here about uh, pagans. We're talking about uh, theologians from the mainline churches and the Roman Catholic Church. They use this method. Most scholars today don't believe that Moses wrote anything that's in the five books of Moses. They also dissect the New Testament, trying to determine what is reliable and what isn't reliable. 
For example, they see a contradiction between the account of the death of Judas in the Gospels and the book of Acts. Have you ever read the, the account of the, of the death of Judas in the Gospels? It says that he went and hung himself. But in Acts it says he fell a long distance and uh, his stomach exploded and his innards came out. So they say, see, the, you have a case here of two different authors. By the way, Matthew didn't write Matthew, according to them. And, and Luke probably just didn't get it right. That's the way scripture is treated today. In the religious world. In, in liberal Protestantism. Ellen White presents a beautiful harmony between the two stories. As she usually does. She says that Judas went uh, to, to where there was a dead tree. And he put the rope over one of the high branches of the tree to hang himself, and he was so heavy because Ellen White said he was the high, the tallest of the apostles. And when he when he jumped off the limb to hang himself, the branch broke, and he fell a long distance to the ground, and his belly exploded and his innards came out. So. Is the gospel account in contradiction to the account in the book of Acts? No. He did commit suicide. He just didn't expect the, the branch to break and to die in that way. So, so uh, th what they do is they dichotomize scripture. They, 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 they say this, this was, uh, you can't trust this and you can't trust this because these are individual accounts by these uh, individuals in different times. They don't believe that the Holy Spirit superintended the composition of scripture. Now, conservative evangelical scholars who expound Bible prophecy are also guilty of dissecting scripture. Dispensationalists, have you ever heard of dispensationalists? Dispensationalists radically dichotomize the Old and New Testaments. They say the Old Testament was by law and the New Testament is by grace. That's the evangelical position. Old Testament law, New Testament grace. Although in the evangelical world, many scholars are starting to change their view. They're starting to say that the Old Testament had law and grace, and the New Testament has law and grace. So the scholarly world is shifting somewhat on that. But basically they say that God has two mutually exclusive plans for Israel and the church. And we'll have a lot more to say about this. They say that God had one plan for Israel, and he has another plan for the Christian church. And some of them even say that God has a heavenly destiny for one and he has an earthly destiny for the other. And they say that now God, we're in the church age, God is dealing with the church, but at the rapture he's going to take the church away and then his plan will kick in for the Jews. Because God has two mutually separable peoples. And this is the great counterfeit that, that, that makes it so difficult for people to accept Adventism. And we're going to have a room to discuss this. We're going to take two whole sessions to discuss the schools of interpretation and the serious implications that are involved in accepting uh, any one of these interpretations. In Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 42, Ellen White wrote, when a man feels so very wise that he dares to dissect God's word, his wisdom is with God counted foolishness. In the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 919, she says, do not let any living man come to you and begin to dissect God's word, telling what is revelation, what is inspiration, what is not, without rebuke. Tell all such that they simply do not know. They simply are not able to comprehend the things of the mystery of God. What we want is to inspire faith. We want no one to say, this I will reject and this I will receive. But we want to have implicit faith in the Bible as a whole, as it is. Praise the Lord for that. We need to take the Bible as it reads. And you know, even in the Adventist church these days, if I might just mention for a couple of moments here a controversial issue, you know, the issue of uh, roles of men and women in the church. You know, there are those in our midst that are saying, you know, uh, you can't really take 
Paul's interpretation of Genesis as authoritative. You know, where, where Genesis very clearly has, uh, uh, you know, the position that God established originally, that man is the head and the woman is supposed to accept the lead of the man. And the Apostle Paul confirms that. The Apostle Paul says, listen, uh, I do not allow the woman to teach, and that's not talking about teaching Sabbath school lesson, that's teaching with full ecclesiastical authority, uh, uh, to teach or to have authority over the man. He says, because man was created first and then woman. And woman was created man for man, not man for woman. In other words, the Apostle Paul explains what Genesis means. But what they're saying is, you know, we really can't take Paul's interpretation of what Genesis says. What they're doing is they're severing scripture. They're, they're pitting Paul against Moses. When really, you have to take Paul's assessment and interpretation as authoritative as what we find in Genesis. Because Paul was inspired by the same spirit that, in, that inspired Moses. You cannot say, I like this, but I don't like that. It's either the whole of Scripture or nothing. Because eventually, if you start nitpicking with this text and the other, you will end up believing in nothing, as has happened with many biblical scholars. Now, how can we find connections between biblical texts? Well, uh, let's take a couple of examples. I have several here. Uh, but let's uh, take, for example, the first one, Revelation 16, Revelation 6 and verse 17. Revelation 6 and verse 17. And, and incidentally, uh, what's of great value here in finding how texts relate to each other is get a good Bible concordance and check out the marginal references. Get a Bible with marginal references that get, have a little letter that show you other verses relating to the verse that you're studying. Uh, so notice Revelation 6 and verse 17. Very interesting question. It's the culmination of the second coming of Christ. The previous verses speak of the second coming. So it says, For the great day of His wrath is come. And who is able to stand? Interesting question. The great day of His wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? Well, if you have a marginal reference or you have a concordance, you'll find some other verses that are very valuable in understanding this verse. And that will tell you who will be able to stand. Let's go to Psalm 24. And I hope you look up all these verses. I mean, there's, there's a, in every verse here, there's something, something to be found. Uh, notice Psalm 24 and verses 3 through 6. Psalm 24 verses 3 through 6. You see, in, in Revelation chapter 6, it doesn't tell you who's going to be able to stand and what their character is like. Unless you go to the next chapter where it speaks of the sealing of the 144,000, and there it doesn't even tell you the character they have. It simply tells you that they're being sealed. You have to go to Revelation 14, 1 to 5, to know what their character is going to be like. What is the character going to be like of those who say, who shall be able to stand? Notice chapter 24 of Psalm verses 3 through 6, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. It tells you something about their character. It's asked the same question. Notice also Isaiah 33 and verses 12 through 16. Isaiah 33 and verses 12 through 16. Do you know who's going to live in the midst of the flames of, of, of uh, hell eternally? You know, the, the churches out there, they say, oh, the wicked are going to burn in hell forever. But the Bible teaches that it's the righteous that are going to live in the fires. Amen. <laughs> they, got it, they got it the wrong way around. You say, what? The Bible says that the righteous will live in the midst of the fire? Incidentally, the fire is God's glory. You're going to have a handout that deals with the issue of hell. We're going to take a look at what the Bible has to say about that. Uh, but there are multiple texts that show that the fire is God's glory. 
it's so glorious that when the that when God's people are standing on the sea of glass, it looks like it's mingled with fire, because Ellen White says that the glory of God shines on, on the water. Wow. Isaiah 33 and verse 12. And the people shall be like burnings of lime. Like thorns cut up, they shall be burned in the fire. Hear, you who are afar off, what I have done, and you who are near, and acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. And now comes the question. Who among us shall dwell with a devouring fire? Is that related to what we read in Revelation 6? Yes. Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Now here comes the surprising answer. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed, bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Does it tell us about uh, the character of those who will be able to stand? See, if you're only in Revelation 6, you don't have the whole picture. You have to use the marginal references or your concordance. Look up the word stand, and that'll give you uh, several texts to look up. Uh, one more before we bring this to an end. Joel chapter 2 and verse 11. Uh, the previous verses are describing the second coming of Christ. And I want you to notice the question that is asked. Joel chapter 2. And verse 11, after describing the second coming, it says, The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can endure it? Now if you read the following verses, you're going to find a description of the Day of Atonement. You're going to find what preparation is necessary to be able to stand in verse, verse 12 through verse 17. It speaks about the Day of Atonement, fasting, afflicting the soul, gathering around the sanctuary, so to speak, so that you can be able to stand in the last day. So does it help us to go to a concordance and marginal, uh, marginal references and look up all of these additional passages? Does it help us understand Revelation 6 verse 17? It most certainly does. The Bible is its own interpreter. The Holy Spirit plays everything we need to understand every single verse. Okay, we'll take a break.